Uh, Joseph Shelzy is a research fellow at the Sufan Group, focusing on military affairs and operational ana analysis. The Sufan Group has uh, common said, Joseph, that this attack is classic ISIS-K, ISIS um, and that the group has, for a long time, had a bone to pick with Russia. Can you lay that out for me a little bit? Yeah, that's that's absolutely true, Dana, and, and thank you for having me. Um, Russia has long, for a long time been in the crosshairs of the jihadist movement starting around the 1980s, um, you know, during the Soviet Union days. Um, um, the invasion of Afghanistan was a, a major trigger for, for upset among um, Muslim communities around the world. But then following that, um, general treatment of Russian Muslim minorities within you know, Russia, as well as the post-Soviet states, has um, has also been a major motivator and factor uh, driving recruitment and radicalization, specifically uh, the wars in Chechnya um, and the unrest in Dagestan, um, as well as the Russian involvement um, military operations in Syria. Yeah. How, how ironic, by the way, that one of Russia's main fighting forces in Ukraine uh, in the certainly in in the initial year were Chechen fighters uh, that that were pledging their allegiance to President Putin. You, you think that that would be the last group that would be, you know, the, on the on the tip of this of the Russian spear in in Ukraine? Yeah, that's right. It it is a it it is a strange um, alliance, um, but yeah, you know, I, I think with the right amount of of uh, patronage networks and um, lining of pockets. A lot of different things are possible, um, and I think that's what we saw played out in uh, in the Ukraine. There, yeah, money talks. Um, how credible are claims on ISIS websites that that ISIS carried out this attack at the Crocus uh, Music Hall, this horrendous attack on, on Friday? I mean, I would say that they're they're credible. Um, this is consistent with um, ISIS Central's um, ideology, and specifically with ISK, IS, you know, Islamic State Khorasan Provinces, um, tactics, techniques, and procedures. This this fits with their goals. Um, they've they've targeted Russia before, um, not only in propaganda, but with uh, you know a suicide bombing uh, against the Russian embassy in Kabul. Uh, so it it absolutely tracks, and it's it's not, I wouldn't say surprising. Um, maybe it's surprising that uh, the Russian security services, uh, despite the warning of you know the the U.S. government, were not able to disrupt the plot. That may be surprising, but uh, but no, I, I I would say those are credible claims. Well, let's address that. Why do you think that the Russian security services so badly failed here? Um... Not to mention the fact that the president himself stood in front of the FSB and said, you know, the, the warnings from, from the U.S. in Britain are a provocation designed to disrupt uh, disrupt our election. So, I mean, he undermined it from the beginning. Sure. Yeah, I think that it's a combination of factors. Um, I think hubris was part of it. Um, I think they were overconfident in their ability to identify and disrupt plots within Russia. Um, I also think there's an obvious level of, of mistrust between the U.S., Russia, and, and the U.K., and that's understandable given the circumstances. Um, the other thing is that most of their security establishment is no longer focused on you know, domestic terrorism, jihadist terrorism within Russia. They've shifted they're focused almost entirely to Ukraine. Um, and so it's not beyond the pale there. It's not be like out of the question that something like this would have been uh, missed by a security service that's extremely overtaxed and distracted, not to mention the number of casualties that a lot of the first responders, um, you know, with units, for example, like Rose Guardia uh, Special Forces, you know, the first responders to an incident like this typically, you know, the casualties that those units um, received in the opening days of the war in Ukraine. So a lot of the folks that would have been addressing this threat 
prior to execution and then post execution, they're no longer around or they're focused elsewhere. So in any other society, they would be, you know, calling for the heads of government and uh, for certainly the, the security services uh, heads for failing here. So is, so is there some smoke and mirrors here as to why, does that answer part of the question as to why Putin immediately started accusing Ukraine and the United States and Britain of carrying out this attack? I'd, I'd say that's that's probably part of it. Um, it is, it, it, I mean, on top of the tragedy of it, it's an enormously embarrassing event for President Putin and for the Russian security services. So it, it is it is absolutely reasonable to to expect them to try to try to react in a way that would save face for them um, or distract from the the intelligence failure that led to this. Um, and of course, you know who who else to to blame than first you know the Ukrainians and you know followed by the U.S. and the U.K. Um, so yeah, I think that that's that, that absolutely makes sense. Um, I guess knowing Russia the way I do, that I see some of this is quite ominous because not only will they try to save face by doing this by blaming Ukraine, um, but I, I would suspect that there will be some pretty serious payback, payback in Russian terms, um, initiated against. I don't know. I don't want to say Western targets, but certainly Ukraine itself, uh, to satisfy the anger within Russia. Would you agree with that? I don't see a direct path for escalation as a result of this in the war in Ukraine uh, beyond what has already been pursued by the Russian state. I think what is feasible and and kind of and matches up with with what you're saying is that there's absolutely going to be internal crackdowns as a result of this um you know in a country where it's already very very difficult um you know and potentially fatal to be political opposition it's going to become even more difficult um and so i think that you know of course as embarrassing as this is putin has used crises like this in the past to great effect and he is absolutely going to capitalize on this one as well um to institute further crackdowns on political opponents and critics, as well as um, you know the Muslim community at large and within Russia. Yeah, uh, you know it's hard to imagine him tightening the screws any more than he already has. But yeah. it may it may provide some fuel uh, for the Kremlin now after the re-election, which there was already a, a lot of speculation anyway. And now you know add in this that Russia will go to a much bigger uh, mobilization to try and just overwhelm Ukraine in a, a you know, what are, people are speculating could be a summer offensive. Yeah, I, I think that that's, that's something that's been in the cards for a while. Um, and <clears throat> yeah, like I said, they're, they're not gonna let this, the, the security establishment and, and Putin's um, regime are not gonna let this crisis go to waste. And so if, if this is yet another talking point that they can use to justify what will be a an unpopular move to to pursue another round of mobilization? They will use this to justify it in some ways. Um, however tenuous that link is, um, they will they will try to draw that um, either through direct statements or or through um, you know parroting in the in the media. Can the tide be turned here? I mean, we're, we're past you know, a failed counteroffensive by Ukraine, largely failed. Um, the, the Russians through the winter now are gaining some ground, maybe not as quickly as Putin would like everybody to believe, but they're, they're certainly chipping away at Ukrainian uh, dug-in positions. Um, is there a danger, you think, that, that Russia can break through U Ukrainian lines um, if, if this ammunition and Western support isn't very quickly forthcoming? Well, there's absolutely a danger. Um, there's a risk of it. And the longer that um, Western support, lethal aid is delayed, um, the more that risk increases. Uh, I think that 
the Ukrainian military is in a tenuous position right now. Um, and I, I do see the momentum shifting in the Russians' favor on, on the battlefield. Um, and I'm, I'm worried about the, the amount of ammunition stocks, equipment, vehicles that, that the Ukrainians have in reserve, their ability to rotate forces off of the front lines for, for rest, um, as well as for, for additional training. Um, and I, I'm, I'm also concerned about the, uh, the lack or the absence of a significant fortified line to buttress the Ukrainian defense, um, akin to what we saw the Russians do with the Surovikin line. Something like that on the Ukrainian side doesn't exist in the same, um, at the same scale. And with the talking points largely surrounding a shift towards a defensive posture for this year for the Ukrainians, um, something like that will be uh, necessary, if not vital. Can I ask your read, uh, Joseph Shelzy, on some of the threats that um, some of the Russian parliamentarians have made, former President Medvedev have made to the Baltics, and then now you have today uh, President Lukashenko of Belarus talking about threatening the Baltics and and that Belarus military potentially participating in a land grab to link uh, Russia and Belarus to to Kaliningrad. It's uh, it's called the Suwalki Gap. Sure. Is, is that yeah. and my question maybe has two parts to it, and that is, is that a distraction? Is that meant to? threaten the west like nuclear weapons do and say you know there better be a there better be a peace deal at some point here you better recognize the 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 land we've taken in eastern ukraine um or or are they serious i mean do you think that they they may push um and try to go against nato these are nato countries that's right yeah i mean crossing the swalky gap would be a. Uh would trigger Article 5, which would have uh, a whole cascade of consequences for for Russia and, and its allies, um, Belarus among them. And they're aware of that, I, 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 I have to believe. Um, I think that there, there are a couple of reasons for statements like this. I've, I've heard it described specifically about Medvedev is that he's kind of a, um, is used to to test some of the more ridiculous sounding policy ideas that come out of the the Kremlin or that are circulating in the halls of the Kremlin, and he's someone that can can push these ideas just to see what kind of reaction they get from the public, from international audiences. Um, so I think there's an element of that, um, but I also think there's a deterrent element. It is it is posturing. Uh, to show, hey, we we do take this seriously. Um, you know, Russia will, um, Russia has the capability to close the Sawalki gap um, in the near term. Um, question of whether or not they can you know, retain that territory um, in the face of a NATO response. Um, so it's deterrent in that way, and it it shows a a degree of of capability or menace. I think. Um, and then the other piece is it communicates to a domestic audience. I think that the Russian, you know, Vladimir Putin's base wants to see uh, a strong Russia and statements like those um, support that image of, of the Russian state and, and of themselves. So just, just to follow up and finish, really, um, you say that they could probably take the Suwalki gap and then it would take NATO some time to respond and whether they could hold it or not, whether the Russians could hold it or not is, is a question. I mean, this has been talked about for years. It's a very likely scenario. Why has, why has NATO not built a better defense there so that there's no way that the Russians would even attempt it? I mean, it's almost like there's an invitation by lack of NATO muscle um, for, forward deployed? Well, I think that's the benefit of, of having a nuclear alliance. Um, you don't need to rely on the same degree of forward manpower intensive, material intensive defensive strategies that you would 
uh, in the absence of nuclear weapons. And of course, I'm not saying that um, you know, nuclear weapons would be used in, in response to Belarusian or Russian crossing of the Suwalki gap, but it does inform NATO's disposition and its, its policy of defense. Um, it doesn't expect, NATO doesn't expect to defeat an initial Russian incursion into NATO territory. It's not realistic. Look at the Baltic states. Um, they expect to delay it, disrupt it, um, and then have the um, have the logistics capacity and base in order to uh, receive and and move onward um, material manpower in order to um, counterattack and reclaim that territory. Joseph Shelsey, Joseph, good to talk to you again. I really appreciate it. And uh, I, I've asked you to speculate on a lot of stuff and, and it's hard, but that's kind of the lay of the land right now with Russia. It's hard to know where they're heading and what they intend to do. And I guess everybody has to sit back and kind of anticipate the what ifs. Um, and I appreciate you entertaining some of that. Yeah, sure. Happy to do it.